Federal elementary and secondary education intervention is a failure, and I'll give you some basic statistics for that, and it is unconstitutional. So the academic failure piece. If you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is sort of our national test where we try and gauge how American students are doing, if you look at the scores for 17-year-olds, and these are kind of you know, high school seniors, which you might call the final products of our school system, if you look at their scores over the last roughly 40 years, so basically the entire time that the federal government has been involved in elementary and secondary education, if you look at those scores, they are almost completely flat, no improvement whatsoever. This despite a roughly 300% real increase, inflation-adjusted increase, in federal per pupil spending. I don't think you can get a more compelling set of data than that to show that federal education policy has failed. But if you need to corroborate that, you can also look at our standing in international exams like the TIMS tests or the PISA tests, and you can see there we have stagnated or gotten worse. Now, there is a completely legitimate argument to say that, well, test scores don't really capture everything that we want out of education. I think that that's accurate. However, the National Assessment of Educational Progress is a federal test. This is what the federal government uses as its gauge of success. So by the federal government's own test, federal policy has failed. And next we have the Constitution. The federal government has specific enumerated powers, Article I, Section 8, and nowhere among them will you find anything about education or schooling. That means the federal government has no authority to govern education. Pure and simple. There are two ways, though, constitutionally, that the federal government can be involved. Under the 14th Amendment, the federal government has a responsibility to ensure that state and local governments do not discriminate in their provision of education. And the federal government has jurisdiction over the District of Columbia. So the federal government absolutely has constitutional authority to say how D.C. runs its schools and absolutely has constitutional authority to have the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. So there's a little irony in that the one thing you hear the most opposition based on local control to was, well, local control says we shouldn't have a federal DC scholarship or voucher program. Well, that's the one area the federal government can be involved in. Otherwise, what the federal government is doing is unconstitutional. Now, the big news in education, at least at the federal level, the last couple of weeks has been that Secretary Duncan has said that if Congress doesn't reauthorize the No Child Left Behind Act by August 1st, essentially the administration will do it for Congress. What Secretary Duncan has said is that he will begin to issue waivers to states to get out of lots of requirements of No Child Left Behind. And not just that, but most importantly would say that would be conditioned on states agreeing to do a whole bunch of things that the administration wants it to do. And that can be, for instance, adopting national curricular standards, as was done through the Race of the Top program. Or it could be to say that all states have to have a, a, a longitudinal data system, as was pushed through Race of the Top. In other words, we can actually look at the Race to the Top program, which is $4.35 billion in the stimulus that the, that the Secretary and the Obama administration used to twist state arms to doing their bidding, and see that now uh, applied to the No Child Left Behind Act without a single action by Congress to allow it. So a lot of people are concerned about the Secretary's threat to use these waivers, but I would submit to you that this has come too late. If you haven't been saying that everything the federal government is doing in education is unconstitutional, as it almost all of it clearly is, then it's too late to start saying, well, now we should obey the Constitution. Of course, we would want to follow the proper procedures of, the, of laws, originate with the legislature, but we have to go more basic than that and say everything the federal government is doing, unless it's part of the 14th Amendment or in D.C., is unconstitutional. And when we gave up doing that, we sort of ceded to the federal government and the branches of the federal government the ability to do whatever they want because the rule of law has been eroded. And we absolutely need to keep that at the front of our minds. And now many people say, well, okay, I could accept this, this unconstitutionality, if I thought the federal government could do good in education. But the fact of the matter is that federal government cannot do 
good in education because all the incentives, the incentive structure that goes into federal policy making is almost all against making good policy. And it all comes down to concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. The people who benefit most from the policy are going to be the most involved in the politics. And the people who, who get the most out of the education system, it's not the children, it's not the parents, it's the people employed by the system. That's their livelihood. So we're talking about teachers unions, administrators associations, other groups. And these are rational people. They're not better or worse than the rest of us. And they tend to want what I want and what most people want which is they'd like to get paid as much as possible and not have someone tell them whether you're doing a good job. <laughs> and and it's totally rational. I mean, I'd love it if, if Cato would pay me, you know, a, a salary that has no top and nobody said whether or not I was actually earning it. Um, and so politicians are also self-interested. And what they want to do generally is to get votes and win re-elections and have people run nice advertisements about them. And so generally that means the people they will respond to are those people employed by the system, those people who are most motivated, not the parents and children. So thanks to that, we will almost never see, unless we have an aberration for a short period of time, federal education policy making sense. And if you look at the last 40 years, you can see just irrefutable evidence that that is the case. Now, many people will say, well, but states and local districts don't do any better. They are subject to concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. And that's, that's true. Now, there are a few things that make it better if you keep control of education at the state or district level. States do, to an extent, have to compete with one another. Districts do, to an extent, have to compete with one another. And so there is some competition to provide better services, including education. And then we have sort of a, a safety feature. You've probably heard the term that the states are laboratories of democracy. The real safety here is that if you leave control over education with the states, one state can try something, which might be promising but also has risk. And if that doesn't pay off, if it turns out to be very damaging, the damage is isolated to that state. The whole country doesn't go down when they try something that doesn't work out. And so it's essential that we maintain these laboratories of democracy. Um, but again, it's, it's true. States and local districts are subject to concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. Most states have done a pretty poor job of running education, and many, many districts have done a poor job of running education. That's why the ultimate solution is educational freedom. Give control of funding to parents so that they can vote immediately with their feet when they're not happy with what a school is providing. So if you think about how you try and affect change and get what you want politically, it's often a multi-year, multi-decade process of, well, we'll build grassroots support so that we can get on the radar of policymakers, and then they can try and get support of other policymakers, so eventually we can get a law passed that will begin to move things the way we want, and then if we can get that law passed, we'll have to monitor the regulations and how people are complying with it for many more years, and you can see why teachers unions, administrators associations have a huge advantage there. They can employ people full-time to watch all this, whereas parents and citizens have lives they have to, to run and couldn't possibly monitor all this. So you have to give them the ability to, to vote with their feet, immediate accountability, not interminable political change. And you need to give educators freedom. One of the arguments against No Child Left Behind comes from educators and they say they're stifled by rules and regulations and they can't try new things or specialize. And that is true. And you need to give them the ability to do that so that you have flexibility, competition, innovation, and what holds that in check is that you let parents be customers. Uh, because of this, because I think ultimately the change has to fundamentally change the system, where the parents have the power, there's lots of freedom, and you have competition like in a free market. This is why I think that the A-plus Act and, and Lindsay's proposal, that she's going to talk about in much more detail than I am, are much better than the status quo, and, and she'll tell you why. But I think that there's another act that, that's actually better, that's been proposed, and I, I understand will be reintroduced, which is something called the LEARN Act from Congressman Garrett in, from New Jersey. And basically what this would do is get the hook that the federal government has on states away from it. And that hook is, you only have to comply with No Child Left Behind if you take federal money, and so people will tell you, well, No Child Left Behind is totally voluntary. 
It's just that states want the money. But of course, what's forgotten is that money is taken involuntarily from taxpayers, people who live in states and districts. And so to break that connection and bypass those states and districts, which are subject to concentrated benefits and diffuse costs, what this act would do would say a state would declare we'll run our own education system and basically the citizens of that state would get a tax break as a result proportionate to what they would have spent on federal education policy. So you break that spending connection and you no longer pretend that it's the states or districts that are sending the money but you recognize it's taxpayers that are doing that. And that is the key. Of course, that is just, I think, moving us very far in the right direction, but ultimately, remembering what the Constitution says, the only acceptable solution in the end is for the federal government simply to get out of education, because it doesn't have the constitutional authority to be involved, and if you look at what we've gotten from 40 years of federal intervention, you can tell they don't have the wherewithal to actually improve anything anyway. 